Hi, this is Patrick Lamb. Welcome to Off the Record. Since his debut release of Crazy Life in 1973, Gino Vanelli has remained one of the most distinctive voices in the world. Vanelli's evolving music has kept his fan base growing for over 40 years, from rock, jazz, soul, and even classical. He has left no musical stone unturned. With an amazing 19 albums under his belt, most of them hitting the Billboard charts, his recent PBS special Live in LA hit number one on Amazon. Adding to the 20 million records he has already sold worldwide, Vanelli is now releasing the 20th record, a brand new collection of recently written songs on his acoustic guitar. Whether performing piano, voice, concerts in theaters, singing before symphony orchestras and concert halls, big bands, or pop ensembles for his fans, Vanelli remains impassioned and true to his art as ever. His standing as a powerful and innovative live performer, his genius musical skills as a composer, poet, producer, arranger, and band leader keep his career rising in greater heights. My guest is a living legend known for his platinum hits like I Just Want to Stop, Black Cars, Wild Horses, Living Inside Myself, winner of several Juno Awards and Grammy nominations. He has toured the world many times over. You can see him in the next few weeks on the Rock and Romance Cruise coming up, which is now sold out. International dates in Montreal, Toronto, Blue Note, Hawaii, and the list goes on and on. A good friend of mine, and truly, in my opinion, one of the greatest ever. Please welcome my friend and guest today, Gino Vanelli. Gino, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Patrick. You have a record out, a new record out, entitled Wilderness Road. Uh, you know, I want to read a lyric from it that if your fans had to pick one paragraph to describe you, uh, might serve them well. It reads, on Wilderness Road, I threw shadows to the wind, chased after a star, stopping at nothing. Wherever they may, I let the chips fall. On Wilderness Road, I left my life to chance. Only now I see it wasn't chance at all. You know, it's a very intimate sounding recording. Uh, somewhat of a departure from the powerful wall of sound that you've been touring with with your Live in LA PBS special. How would you characterize the new release to your fans out there? You know, I had I had no desire really, Patrick, to, to record another album unless I had something different to say and found a new way of saying it. And uh, for literally for four or five years, I went to the studio um, experimenting with sounds. I wanted to bring a certain sense of uh, Americana to the soul and jazz and rock abilities that, that you know I brought forth you know in the past. And it took me a while to know how much of that Americana style to really interject. On a few early tries, it was just too much. And I found when I did my vocals, I wasn't really that kind of singer. So when I just found the right amount, um, it became something new. And this album is called Wilderness Road. For that reason, that song you quoted from is, is called Wilderness Road. Um, it's a really different effort for me. Uh, it, it is very intimate, a lot of narratives, a lot of storytelling, uh, something I haven't done before in the past. Um, and it, uh, it took me a, a little while to know how to sing my own songs because singing dramatic soul is a whole different technique from singing you know a story are you gonna be able to work some of these songs into the the new show oh yeah uh, yeah and yeah. How, how does that work how do you uh, since it's so so different well it is a bit of a trick because you know it, it's not most of the material are, uh, is not like what we do in our show so it's gonna have to be set up right and I have to explain to the audience what this song is about so on and so forth um, but we'll know, you know, after Montreal and Toronto, we'll, that's where we're going to de debut them first in about a month from now. Right. Take us back to Montreal, to where it all started. Did, did the city of Montreal, by being so far away from the music business, actually indirectly instill that fire in you? You know, fire is, 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 comes from, from various places, you know. Some of the fire came from the fact that I was very unhappy at home and I needed to leave home. And I think a, like a lot of kids, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, we just couldn't wait to, you know, spread our wings and get out there. But you had a great family support. I right? did, but, but still I, I needed to get away. I wanted to be my own person, my own. And how did, how did you know? How did, when did you know that I, that I just, I got to get out of here? I, I knew it since <laughs> I was... 11 or 12 years old and I was playing as a relief drummer in, in the Casaloma Club in Montreal. 
that music was going to be my life. And then I had various groups when I was 13, 14, 15, played in a group called the Soulmates when I was 16, had a record deal when I was 17, right out of high school. Um, then I'm, I went to McGill for a little bit. That didn't really work out because it, it just, it's not that it was too slow, it was just it felt redundant to me and, and that I was on a different trajectory. So I moved to New York for a year, year and a half. And, was there uh, a was there a moment though that you remember in Montreal where you're like, Th that's it, I've got to, I've got to leave, or was it just kind oh, of a gradual? That. I knew that. Okay. I knew that yeah. from, from 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 the get go, and I already had, you know, traveled quite a bit by the time I was twelve and thirteen with various groups around the province. So I knew what it was. So like you checked travel. everything out. You knew the what it well, had I to knew, offer. I knew I, I knew I knew the ropes. I knew, I knew what it would take, and it it, it wasn't going to be done behind a desk or at home. Mm -hmm. I had to get out there, you know, and, and kind of sling myself around in the mud. I got you. Gotcha. Do you consider yourself Canadian, American, or Italian? You know, I never really considered myself Canadian, American, or Italian. I never really stopped and, and understood, you know, um, and really took it in and ate it and digested it and said, oh, I am this. But you speak so many languages. You speak, well, how many languages do you speak? Well, uh, French was our second language, so um, I'm still... You know, pretty well versed in language. A little bit of Italian. I used to speak a lot of Italian when I was very, very young. Uh, basically, the Romantic languages. But uh, you know, to really to answer your question, um, I travel around the world so much that the, you get to feel a little bit like a world citizen. Now, the only thing I, I can say, though, uh, in regards to you know the beginning, I really understood Canadian history how. Canada got its freedom, how it broke away slowly, you know, from, from the crown and things like that. Um, the constitution in Canada. And then when I, when I um, in the last few years, I, w I became very interested in the American constitution and to try to understand how it played a part in music. Why we are free to do what we want to do. Why we are free to say the things we want to say, make the music mm -hmm. we want to say. So in that respect, I got to respect... Um, uh, the, both the American and the Canadian, you know, way of life. When you were um, when you were in high school, were you like the most popular guy in school, or you know, uh, voted most likely to succeed, or this this kind of thing? What no. what were you like in high school? No, I, I I was. People would have probably mistook me for a troubled soul, because I just didn't want to be there. I wanted to make music. Um, I I was playing the drums, practicing the drums day in, day out, when I was 12, 13, 14. I uh, was also um, taking piano lessons and guitar lessons. Uh, I was learning to play all the, the rhythm and the rhythm section instruments. And so my heart and, and my head was constantly on music. Uh, I wanted to be, uh, in a sense, part musicologist, so I listened to the radio, all the records, all the jazz records, all the big band records, the Latin records, the opera records, everything I could, you know, lay my ears on. So um, unfortunately, my heart and soul really were always, you know, with, with music, and I just got by scholastically. Okay, so so you, when you come to America, um, you, A and M Records, uh, that's where it all started with Herb Alpert and you rushing the gates, as as, as it were. For those of us who don't know Herb Alpert uh, as anything other than a, a, a music mogul that he is, what kind of man or personality was he to you at that time? And uh, how did he help you? You know, Herb was and is a unique person. He, you know, yes, he was a, a um, tremendously influential music mogul in the sense that he was the A of A and M Records, which was the the biggest independent label of the time, and they had a lot of great groups, including Joe Cocker, Cat Stevens, The Carpenters. Um, Sergio Mendez, I mean Quincy Jones, the list went on. Carol the largest King. people in show business. Really, really, yeah. yeah. You know, even George Harrison made a deal with them. So, um, the first time, upon meeting Herb, the first time, uh, I knew he was a different guy, and he wanted to work with me personally. He was a, he was a musician, and yet he was in control of a, a, a very large record company. Did he did he guide you, or did he kind of just let you do yes, your he own did. thing? As a producer, he was more of a guy who was just sort of um, patting you this way and that way and reminding you of a few a things. A suggestion here, yeah. a reminder there. Sometimes even just a, a nudge, you know, was enough because he understood that I was really listening to him. But he was not a demanding guy, never a demanding guy. 
And um, by the time I got to the Powerful People album, the second album, I really had these 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 ideas to to uh, create orchestration with synthesizers and things like that. And that was not his bag. He didn't he, like it. No, he didn't like. Did it. Did he just like say, "Forget it, Gino, don't do that"? No. He, see, that's where <laughs> Herb is unique. He said, "It's your vision." He said, "I'll give you a chance to do it," but he says, "I'll, I'll executive produce, but I won't do the day to day." Because mm -hmm. he says, "You seem to be on to it." He says, "So go ahead." Hmm. So in that sense, you know, I really appreciated uh, his involvement with me. Mm. So what, what would you say to aspiring musicians now uh, that look up to you and are trying to make it in this crazy, uh, changing music business and, uh, and with what you now know about the industry, what, what would you say to them? Well, there's a lot to say. First of all, you know, it, it ain't going to be done without hard work, and that means um, the the um, the work with yourself, the practice, the hours. I mean, there's a lot of practicing, a lot of a lot of inner research. That's one thing. The second thing is listen to the best. Mm -hmm. Always listen and listen. I mean, listen to the best musicians and don't only listen to the musicians of your time. I didn't only listen to the musicians of my time. I was a real aficionado of Cole Porter, of of, of yes, Bert Backrack and Jimmy Webb and uh, Lennon McCartney and. Uh, David Gates and all, all those good writers of the time, Carol King. But I also went back to you know Sammy Kahn and uh, Gershwin and and uh, Jerome Kern and Rodgers and Hammerstein. Tried to understand them. Um, and so work with the greats only as just continue. Well, to... if you don't work with them, at least mm -hmm. listen to them and try to dissect them and try to understand how they got to where they're going to. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one thing. And and second of all is is. Um, See your career as a long-term thing. You know, yes, I mean, have the urgency to try to get it done as soon as possible. Um, but, you, you know, if you, I, as a young man at 21 or 22 years old, I did see my career way into my 50s and 60s and possibly 70s um, because I knew it would take me that long to get really that good. To it was, it's, so it's a long throw. It's it really not, not a, sh a lot of people, a lot of kids these days are looking for the short throw. They want that immediate hit, and then one, once, the they, once they get it, they don't know what to do. I, you know, I admire my audience that I play before, and um, I don't take them for granted. And I know that they, in a sense, trust me. Mm -hmm. You know, to to be really diligent and to look for something that's that's different and excellent and all those things that kind of made me who I am. And um, to really to, to, to really follow up on that trust is really, really important. So that's another thing I would tell aspiring young musicians is to earn your audience's trust. You know, you, you've pushed yourself over the years to explore different genres, you know, um, and, and your different records reflect that. Uh, you've talked about reaching a turning point in your life where you had to make a choice between commercial success or authenticity. Uh, was there a day that you can remember when you said, you know, I'm not doing this, I'm doing that, um, and took that f first step out on the, the uh, proverbial wilderness road? You know, it, it happens all the time. I mean, it happened even at, at the age 22, 23, when I handed in an album called Storm at Sunup to, to, to A&M Records. Herb didn't like it at the time, and Jerry Moss, the other part of, of A&M, the M of A&M, he wasn't really wild about it, too, And I, I, but I knew it was a good album. You believed in it. I believed in it. I, I thought it was my best, my best work to date. I had only done two albums since then, but I thought it was my best record. And I said, I'm going to go out and tour, and I'm going to promote the album. Please put it out. And they, they really admired my passion, so they put it out. And um, a year later, when I was recording just at the Gemini in England uh, with Jeff Emmerich, uh, the engineer who did all the Beatles stuff, um, I remember Jerry Moss came to me and said, you were right, you know, we were wrong. The album is, is just about to go gold. And it didn't mm -hmm. have a single or anything like that on it. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I, you know, I had supervision or anything like that, but I just had an inkling. I mm -hmm. just had an instinct that that was the right thing You believed to do. in that and they believed in you. Well, they they got to respect me a little bit, a little bit more after you sold your first five hundred thousand. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you have to take a shot, you know, on yourself. And I believe that that was really my my best record to date, and it's still a good record. I still play some songs from it, and people still do like many things on the record. Um, I mean, it does have shortcomings, but there are some 
there are some strides made on that record. When, when are other times you've take, taken a shot that you that maybe, uh, or maybe you're always doing that? Do you I feel like it's are always, you you're always doing it? Okay. Always. I mean, when I when I recorded the next album, just the Gemini, I rented a house here in Oregon. That's when I met my wife, and I just I, I we were out in Boring, Oregon, and mm -hmm. I um I rented a C7 Yamaha. And for three weeks, just hammered away, you know, 24 hours a day, and came up with an album that had all well, one side was called the War Suite, and then the record company still didn't wasn't crazy about it, but they put it out, and that ended up selling the most records that that I sold to that date. Mm. And so, I mean, it was always another. The next one was was the, the thing I did with the um, Royal Philharmonic, uh, Popper in Paradise. They weren't so crazy about it. They're like, what are you doing, Gino? Exactly. But I felt that I had <laughs> so you, to do it. So this is a familiar, you're, you're, yes. you're familiar, what are you doing, Gino? And then, That's then another you do thing it, I you know? would say to, to young people. I mean, learn, was it, who was it? Uh, above, all, above all else, know thyself. Was it Plato mm -hmm. or one of those Greek philosophers? An artist must know himself or herself. And once you know yourself, you're willing to go with your instinct. And your instinct is all you have. Because without your instinct, you're lost. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so success came early, you know, for you. Uh, there was a period, and then there was a period where you were sort of MIA. I think it was like uh, seventy-eight to ninety. I didn't tour for 11, 12 years. Well, I, I still made some records, and I and I, uh, I I made the Black Cars record, and that was a very big single for me worldwide, along with Hers to Be in Love. And then I made um, the record of Wild Horses in '86, '87. And that was also a big worldwide single for me, not as much in the United States. So in, in the 80s, I recorded records that, that did well for me um, worldwide, not as much in this country. But I, I didn't tour because um, I was going through a growth period that I was long time coming. I had been sort of on the trajectory of, of, of the music business since I was 12 years old. And by the time I got to 29, 30, I hit a brick wall. I got into some legal um, trouble with Arista Records at the time, and I was blacklisted and, and couldn't record for a long time. And then I fell out of the, the, the touring business, and then I, I got really interested in theology, in history, and, and um, in the humanities. Went back to college, and then I, I got so interested in theology that it wasn't, academia wasn't enough. I got private teachers. I started studying the, the Kabbalah, Hinduism, and Buddhism, and all the Eastern philosophies, Taoism, and I became so keenly interested in all that, that I found um, not only that there was no time, but I found little interest mm. in So you just lost interest in I lost in interest in it. Until one day, um, I remember my uh, fellow, Gary Usher, who was teaching me the Kabbalah. He was, a, he was a minister of the Kabbalah for about 26, 27 years. And he was on his deathbed. And I told him, I said, he only had three days to live. And I said, Gary, I think I, I'm going to study and, and the Kabbalah permanently and, and quit you know, music business. Oh, wow. And he, and he, he summoned me over. And he could barely whisper. And he, he said, you're a complete asshole if you do that. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so I, I said, oh. why do you say that? Because he says it means... It's all about how it affects who you are. It is not the end in of itself. You are the end. And that was just a, a moment of, of enlightenment for me, in a sense, that it was helping me to be who I was, that I didn't have to be it. And so I thought about it for a year, and then that's when we moved up to the Northwest. I built a studio, and I said, I'm going to record the kind of music I want to record. And I was just totally newly inspired. And that's when we met. Yeah, Yonder Tree. In Yonder Tree. Yonder Tree. And from that moment on, I had no doubt as to what I wanted to record. I, and I, not that I was completely fearless, but I was more or less fearless. That I was, I was adamant when I when I suddenly had an idea. I said, "This is the direction I want to go." I had no doubt. I just would go, and lo and behold, the doors would open up. There's this. Uh river that runs through what you're talking about, which is, you know, commercialism uh, versus uh, authenticity. Do you think that uh, they're mutually exclusive? Sometimes they meet and sometimes they cross paths, sometimes they separate. They do, they do two figure eights like this. They mm -hmm. snake into... You kind of have to find, find where the, the two circles interconnect. 
I don't don't try. I don't try to find that because see, because to find that would be to actually to be antithetical. It would be antithetical to my instincts. I leave it to my instincts. The more you chase the commercial thing, by the time you get there and and record those songs that you thought would be commercial, it's already changed. It's already changed. Exactly. <laughs> it's already changed. So, so that's what I'm trying to say. Your your instinct, provided you keep yourself well informed. But aren't you changing too all yes, the time? You so it's kind of like boxing underwater. Well, you listen to. To music, you listen to new music, you listen to old music, you keep in touch. So you keep your instincts kind of on fire. Okay. Your instincts, you know, could age too, but you keep your instincts current. Gotcha. And and if your instincts are current, then you 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 depend on them. And and with this new record, I my instincts were to go were to mix Americana with soul, with R and B, with a little bit of jazz, slight classical, but how much of those influences what would determine it would be my voice. By the time I would sing the songs, I knew right away, I have too much of this or too much of that. So I was, de depending upon the, my instinctual vocal quality, to, to, to set the path. And also, my wife and my son said, that sounds terrible. <laughs> you know, or, forget that. You know. So um, talk about your family. Your brothers have been such a huge part of your, your career. You know, the idea of the Italian family as in general is, we're is, 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 is legendary. Yeah, well, we're anything but that, though. Talk to us about well, that. Well, I mean, it, it's... Can you share? Yeah. Look, families are families. There's love and, and there's, you know, there's loggerheads. It, it, every family has that, <laughs> you know. Just because we're an Italian family doesn't mean that, you know, we're in love with everything everyone does all mm -hmm. the time. You know, I mean... That's just the way it is. But I do have great relationships with with all my family, my brothers. Uh, but you have to know where those where the boundaries are because mm -hmm. we're individual people. I've been reading some of your lyrics anew the last few days. People I belong to. Mm -hmm. uh, reading reading one of the verses that struck me. Um, it goes like this: Oh, my brother, when he was a schoolboy, he gave up all his dreams to take on mine. Oh, my brother, now I have me one other. The things we've said, the things we've done, stay in my heart since I was young. Is that is that about Ross? You know, Ross was um, a 13 or 14 year old bass player in my band. You know, and Joe was my older brother keyboardist. So we were really intertwined. Is, it, is this a love song for your family? Well, of course it is. I mean, people I belong to is. It really is one way of saying those people have always been your heart. How did your family support you like very early on? Do you think that that was a, a pivotal thing, or do you think you were just you know ready to rock and roll well, like since you were, since you, you you came out of my out mother of the didn't want me to move to New York, and my my father said let him go. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward, when you became you know a, a pop legend, you know you. You really and you really started to make it, and you became incredibly famous. How, how did you deal with all the praise? Fame is like being in the eye of a hurricane. All this stuff is happening around you, and it's awfully quiet where you are. It's interesting because you're observing all these things going on, but it's awfully quiet. You know, you you're in these crowds of people, and everyone's saying this and saying that. But it's like still, a movie. You still go off to your room at night, and your bed is there, and you're lonely, and you. You go to bed and you're all alone. I mean, it's. Mm -hmm. you, I, I I think it's learning how to deal with the juxtaposition of the chatter and the silence. Mm -hmm. Most of us have maybe a little bit of chatter and some silence, or a lot of silence and a little bit of chatter. When you suddenly become famous, there's a lot of chatter, a lot of flashbots going on, and it makes the moments of silence seem even more silent. What's your rudder through all the ups and downs of, of this crazy business? There's a few lines in the book of the Tao, which is an old Chinese book written by Lao Tzu 2,500 years ago. He, it, basically, all paraphrasing, well, your roots, the top branches, as high as they go, they can only be supported by deep roots. Mm. And so, for me, I do as much inner work as I do outer work. And the inner work is always, you know, the yoga, the meditation, the, 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 the silence. The silent moments where you're just by yourself, you're thinking, the contemplation. And I'm not above prayer or anything like that, although, you know, my kind of prayer may not be someone else's kind of prayer. But mm -hmm. you find a way to commune with those, that empty space inside of you. And I, you know, I'll give you an example. Before I got that record deal, which was really a pivotal point in my life with, with A&M Records, we had run on, out of money 
my brother and I, we had been in Los Angeles for for four months. That's got to suck. We had five dollars <laughs> left. So Joe said, we, "We need to leave." Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, "I'm not leaving Los Angeles without a record deal." He says, "Well, I." He says, "You're gonna have to panhandle. We're out of money." Hmm. So I didn't know what to do. The next day we had a we had a flight booked out, and I I I was doing everything in my mind to avoid it. So I woke up that morning, five o'clock in the morning, started walking along Sunset Boulevard, and I stopped into a church, and I sat down in this church. It was amazingly the the doors were open, and it was totally empty, and I sat down in the pew and I fell asleep. Mm -hmm. It was so early in the morning I was still tired. I woke up four hours later, knowing exactly what to do. And that's mm. when I w ran back to the room, grabbed my guitar, waited outside the gates of a &M, and when I saw Herb Alpert, I said, this is it. I just dropped my guitar and I ran through the gates, chased by the guard and all that kind of stuff. And that's when I met Herb. And that's when Herb gave me a pass to come 30 minutes later, play all those songs. People got to move. All those songs were on albums later. And Herb said, okay, let's record. That's the kind of spirituality I'm talking about, where you have this time where you need to be absolutely silent and listen to your heart and say, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? And what am I not seeing? That's a very, very big question. Hmm. What am I blind to that I, that I cannot see now that I could be made to see? And um, I think if more people ask those questions, we'd, we'd probably have at least a little bit better world. Amen to that. Do you, so do you feel you have a responsibility to your audience or is the role of an artist just to make new works and be an artist independently Frank Sinatra said you you owe nothing to your audience but a, a you know a good performance and, and, and that's very sobering because sometimes you feel like oh I owe this you know I, I should do this I should do that and you feel a little bit enslaved or you know shackled you know to your audience I don't exactly feel like I only owe you know a good performance because truth be told, I, I like actually communing with my audience. I like talking to people, see where their lives are at. I like them asking me questions about my life, where it's going. Um, so I don't feel an outright responsibility, but I can say I feel an interest. In 1980, you were signed to Arista Records with Clive Davis, and uh, the record company engaged in a long battle of creative wills. I read where you were quoted as saying, there comes a day when an artist has to make a hard choice between two roads that lie ahead, uh, knowing full well that the one he knows to be right will lead to a dark forest, leastways for the first foreseeable future, uh, com comes a time when success must be measured by a different yardstick. Uh, what, what was the yardstick in the 70s, and what is it now? In the 70s, uh, it was making the music I wanted to make, and I was very fortunate. When I signed with Arista, I had been I come off a double platinum record, brother to brother. Then I came off a uh, almost platinum, um, more than gold record, Nightwalker, and a big hit, Living Inside Myself. And I knew that was a, a in a sense a trap, because now I'd be forever tied to, you know, uh, putting out hit singles, and I didn't necessarily want to do commercial singles all the time. And I signed this kind of big deal with, with Arista. And something inside of me told me, this is really kind of a trap I'm putting myself in. But I did it because I did it. And I, I never do that again. I, didn't, I never did it again after that. And so the responsibility became a little bit to the record company to make them make their money back. So to give them the kind of stuff. Because it's basically a loan, right? Everything's recoupable. Yes, exactly. They, they give you some money, but then they tell you how to spend it to a well, certain extent. Well, they, they you know? tell you, look, uh, you know, you got to have a radio song for us to make our money back. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't used to that. I was used to saying, just following my instincts. So there was a clash. Mm. And it was really not the right marriage. Half of it was my fault. Half of it was the, them who didn't really buy by the contract. Mm -hmm. So it, it was just a mismatch. That's all I could say. Uh, but the, it, it got ugly and it got personal, which it shouldn't have gotten personal because I was totally willing to walk away and, and let bygones be bygones and all that. But it became personal and I learned my lesson. So what, what's the yardstick now? The yardstick I measure is how do I feel when I wake up in the morning? Do I feel like I've had a good day? Do I feel like, uh, do I, feel like I have a smile on my face? Do I feel like I want to go on? 
Do I feel healthy? Do I feel like I, I want to go running that day? I mean, all those little things. Yes, of course, we all want to be successful. Uh, but you find that if you live only for your work, then your work will suffer. Mm. Your work comes out of you. And if you're set in a certain way, more, more good stuff will come out. Mm. T can you talk about the, the, you've had many bands over the years, some of the, the world's best musicians on the planet Earth have worked, worked with you. Can you talk a little bit about um, the Portland band? How does the Portland band fit into this arc and what makes the Portland band unique? The best musicians in the Northwest, first of all. That's who they are. Um, very, very uh, authentic people. Uh, everyone's got their own character, their own thing, idiosyncrasies, and that's to be expected. But everybody adheres and everybody uh, admires the project. Everybody's there for rehearsals. Everybody's on time. They, they get to the stage. We go through sound check. Everybody's got their parts down. And that to me means a lot, or else I wouldn't do it. I mean, I had a Montreal band for a long time. I had an L.A. band for a long time. Um, I was very fortunate to find a band in my own backyard that loves the tour and that is of such high quality. Live in L.A. was recorded live on stage at the Saban Theater on November 8, 2013, which uh, represents uh, the Vanelli family's first performance in Los Angeles in more than 15 years. The recording also marks the first onstage collaboration in, in many years between the three Vanelli brothers. Can you walk us through just a little bit of the storyline of how the Vanelli brothers went in and out of working together and then regrouped for this PBS special? Well, Ross and I have been working together now for the last 10 years. Uh, we, we produced together in the past. We played in the same bands together in the past. Uh, Ross has become sort of the, the visionary on the manage, management side for me, and he also does a lot of the editing of, of of pictures, films, and things like that. So he, and and, and he does the, the the soundscape, you know, for for live. So Ross is really intimately involved with me, and uh, Joe and I don't are not intimately involved as far as the music business is concerned. Although you know we're very much on speaking terms and, and talk to each other all the time. He has his own studio. Yes, like he, yes. he I was down there, and he was uh, during the recording of Tower of Power. He's working yeah. on a lot of big projects in yeah. Los Angeles. Joe <laughs> works with uh, Chicago. He works with REO Speedback and Tower of Power, Burton Cummings. He, he's done a lot of big projects, and um, I just invited Joe to to, to play on, on on the live in L.A. You know, to play brother to brother. That was fun. I remember yeah. looking down, and he was yeah. down there playing. I was like, wow, this is yeah. this is a yeah. uh, magic moment. Um, Gina, what, what is next for you, uh, or do you feel compelled to even, to even figure it out? Uh, you know, um, the record companies informed me, just informed me uh, yesterday that uh, one of the songs on the new record is going to be picked up by our radio, you know, 100 stations are going on it and all that, and that's kind of fun. I haven't been on, on radio uh, at that level for, for a while now. Yeah, radio play, you know, some radio play my, my older stuff. But it's kind of fun to, to see some new stuff that was just basically just and a, a you glimmer know, in my eye just two day, two years ago. Yeah. Universal is is gotten behind it big time. Yeah, right? you know, yeah, it's Universal out in is April. A, that's the record label. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, S S R G Universal. S R G Universal. That's that's fantastic. Well, Gino, thanks for being on the show. See you at rehearsal. <laughs> I'm Patrick Lamb. Thanks so much for watching Off the Record. If you liked today's interview, please make sure to hit the subscribe button. I'll be releasing new episodes in the upcoming months featuring more of the amazing people I've had the honor of working with over the years. And I've worked with some of the greats. I also want to give a quick shout out to the studio at North Rim where I produce Off the Record. They have a fantastic team here with all of the gear you need to do it right. So if you want to do a show of your own, go to NorthRimStudios.com and check it out. So again, thanks for watching. And be sure to check out my Facebook and Instagram page. Lots of great stuff to come. See you next time on Off the Record. <laughs>